Yeah, great. Everyone can hear me? Okay. Right. Uh, so welcome everybody. Thanks for being here at this like very, very early session. Um, I woke up with a little bit of a lost voice, so let's see if I can just bear with me a little bit if I lose it at times. Uh, but I'll be presenting this paper called uh, Setting the Right Expectations, Algorithmic Recourse Over Time. Um, and this is part of a kind of a large international collaboration uh, with Joao Fonseca, who co-led this project, who's from Nova University in Lisbon, Portugal, um, also with Carlo Brate and Francesco Bonchi, who are from Chendai in Torino, Italy, and then Julia Stanovich, Dr. Julia Stanovich, who's my advisor, who's also at NYU with me. Um, and so I think it's no surprise to everybody in uh, this room that there are significant risks and harms associated with the use of artificial intelligence. Um, and here I'm just going to hold out three kind of classic examples that I think probably some of these everyone here is familiar with. Um, for example, Amazon creating a secret AI recruiting tool that is eventually shown to be biased against women. Um, there's also been racial bias that's been detected in red medical algorithms that can favor white patients, even over sick or black patients. Um, and there's also risks uh, associated with unintended consequences associated with economic risks and harms. Um, so, for example, uh, a majority of those flash crashes that have occurred over the recent years that caused economic instability uh, over the course of a day or two are the result of algorithmic traders. And so, as a kind of a result of these concerns, one idea that has emerged, or one principle that has emerged, is algorithmic recourse. And if you're not familiar with this idea, it's, it's the premise that individuals should have the ability to take action against the outcome of an algorithmic decision-making system. And it's a use case of explainability that's concerned with answering two different questions. The first of which is why an outcome was produced by an algorithmic system. And the second is that what can be done in order to reverse it. And the idea of recourse is that it kind of passes some of the agency of decision-making from the algorithm onto the individual itself. And so the kind of canonical example when we talk about recourse is this idea of the lending example. Um, so in the US, uh, many, many banks and institutions are using algorithms to decide whether or not somebody should be rejected or accepted for a loan. Um, and if they're denied, the US government requires that they be given some kind of adverse action code, also sometimes called a principal reason code. So for example, I could apply for a loan and be told uh, I'm rejected for this loan because I have too much outstanding debt. And recourse would mean that you don't only tell individuals why they were rejected, I have too much debt, but you can also give some advice on what they can do to reapply and be successful at a later date. So for example, you have $1,000 of too much outstanding debt. Um, and so there's really, this is really a critically important concept that's really gotten uh, uh, more attention in the most, in most recent years uh, because it's really seen as morally good and equitable, especially among marginalized groups who generally uh, can benefit more from passing some level of agency on and some of the decision making onto them. Um, Reinforce can also improve systems uh, by telling people what they can do to succeed. You can actually uh, improve the social welfare of everybody who's involved in that system. Um, and then recourse will likely soon be codified into law. Uh, so recently the EU passed uh, at least part one of their landmark artificial intelligence regulation. Um, and there is text in that document that speaks specifically about recourse, uh, but it's not yet known what kind of shape or form that will take in the future. And so the motivation of this work um, is identifying an idea that uh, is critical in recourse that seems to be lacking a little bit from literature, which is this idea of the goal of time. So in almost all cases, recourse implies that somebody makes some kind of initial application at T0. So for example, I apply for a loan and I'm told I have $3,000 of outstanding debt. Then there's some time delta where I try and work on making that correction. So it could be six months, it could be a year, it could be even longer or, or shorter as well. Uh, and then I make my reapplication at T1. And kind of the driving insight of this work is that this time delta, even in some cases where it's very small, can have significant impacts on the reliability of those recourse recommendations uh, because there's a continuously changing context in the real world. In the real world. Um, and so uh, as an example, uh, we can, I, I have like a little toy example here. Um, so on the y-axis of this little graph, we have some kind of score that's been assigned by a decision-making algorithm. Um, so again, you can imagine that this is some bank or institution that's giving out loans and they have enough loans to give out to three individuals. So nine individuals apply, and then the three with the highest score and the, the highest uh, scores are selected for a loan. Now on the x-axis, we have time steps. So what might happen at the next time step is three of these individuals who rejected for the loan might take some kind of action, improve their income, uh, improve their credit score, lower their debt, whatever it might be, and try and increase their score. 
Uh, but if this bank or institution only has resources for three loans, what might happen is that a new individual enters the uh, environment at time one, and this causes this individual, even though they took the action that they were prescribed, to not get the positive outcome or not get the loan. Um, and so while it's kind of a complex scenario, what it really demonstrates is that there's at least some of these edge cases where you could imagine that something happens in the system that makes the initial recourse recommendation uh, less reliable. Um, and there are other works that have been exploring this, and actually they're all from uh, all from uh, very very recent work. So all of these are from uh, 2022. Um, so Farrar and Loy uh, defined something very similar and called it an unfortunate counterfactual events and proposed some methods for mitigating that. Um, there's other work that refers to this as like what could be called a recourse invalidation rate and is looking kind of on individual level and uh, navigating trade-offs between the effort and recourse. Um, and there's also some work showing that due to the causal relationship between features, uh, recourse recommendations can become unreliable over time. And where this work, uh, the contribution of this work is that uh, we propose um, an agent-based simulation framework to kind of model these individual behaviors and, and algorithm recourse at a finer detail than kind of what's been done previously. Um, our framework also operates kind of at a system level. Um, and so we can then analyze the recourse reliability, uh, particularly under resource constraints using a system level analysis. Um, and then we also propose a metric that can be used to kind of quantify the, the promise of recourse, if you will, which we'll come back to a little bit later. Um, so speaking about our approach, so speaking about our, our agent-based model. Um, so we're gonna return again to this, uh, this graph that we saw before where the y-axis is the agent score produced by some kind of decision-making algorithm and the x-axis is the time step. And so as we had before, you could imagine that at this time step, a certain number of individuals, let's say five individuals, uh, enter this environment by applying for whatever the positive outcome is, let's say a loan. Um, and then again, let's assume there's some kind of resource constraint where only two individuals are able to get, uh, to able to get a loan. Then when we move to the next time step, uh, we have this really important behavior that I think is not really well understood that we began to try and model, which is how are people taking recourse? So you can imagine that since this individual is very close to the uh, decision threshold, they take some action for recourse. Uh, maybe this individual feels similarly, and then maybe the last individual, for whatever reason, doesn't make any attempt at recourse. And then again, you might have new individuals applying for loans at time step one, and we select our, our positive outcomes. And so this is kind of a general idea of how we constructed our, our simulation. And this is actually uh, a rather boring example, but here's a, an example of a simulation um, for 100 agents with 20 positive outcomes and 20 new agents entering, um, entering the environment at every time step over 20 time steps. Um, and so when it comes to uh, our simulation, we have a few other modeling considerations. Um, so first of all, given we have to uh, have some kind of agent scoring function, um, and we create some kind of set of features about these agents, but then we can vary things like uh, the initial population size. Um, we consider this idea called like the global ease of recourse, which is that it might be more or less difficult in certain in certain circumstances to get recourse. So, for example, correct or uh, raising your income or lower or raising your credit score is much more difficult than say uh, you you are appealing to social media ban because of, of content that you publish. Um, also, the behavior function of agents, which I'll discuss a little more in detail in the next slide. Uh, we can also vary how agents enter the environment, what their distribution is, but also how many agents enter the environment. Um, this can be important. You can imagine, like, uh, depending on economic conditions, you might you might see more or less applicants uh, for a loan, for example. And then we can also vary the size of the resource constraint. Um, and so when it comes to modeling agent behavior, uh, we incorporate two different considerations, um, so which we could call the effort and adaptation. Um, so effort, I'll start there, uh, is this idea that it's the likelihood that an individual will take any recourse action at all. And in our simulations, we consider two different types of agent behaviors. The first one is a constant effort, which means that the, the likelihood that someone will take effort is intrinsic into that person itself. So regardless of what's happening in the environment, they will or they have some likelihood that they will or will not take action. Um, then we also consider flexible effort. Um, and so this means that they react in some way to what's happening in the environment. So our implementation of this generally has to do with how far they are from the decision threshold. And the idea is like, if you just miss the threshold, if you only need to raise your income, let's say by $1,000, still a very difficult task. 
but much less difficult than raising your income by $10,000. So there might be a how higher likelihood to at least make some kind of attempt at, at, at recourse. Um, then we also look at this idea of adaptation, which is actually how faithfully agents follow recourse recommendations. Um, and so the first one is kind of this naive approach where we assume that if people are following recourse, they're doing exactly what we tell them to do. Okay, raise your income by $1,000, and that's exactly what they get. Uh, the more realistic consideration that we start to model is we allow some variability there, where you might imagine that uh, agents are making progress slowly over time. Um, they might be reapplying at stages like, okay, I need my, I need to increase my income by $500, or I increase my credit score by you know, 20 out of the 50 points, but I'm gonna try again to apply. Um, and they might even overshoot the goal that they've given um, when, they, when they reapply again. So, uh, and once we have all this in place, we can measure kind of what's our, our metric of interest here, which is this idea of reliability of recourse. Um, and so, very, very simply, we can uh, define the reliability of recourse at any time t as out of all the individuals who are given a recourse recommendation and they follow through on that faithfully, how many of them actually got the positive outcome? And using that, we can kind of get some measure of in expectation of how many people should be getting recourse, or how people are getting recourse. And so with this framework in place, uh, one of the benefits of these agent-based simulations is that you can really run an exhaustive set of experiments. Um, and so this is detailed a lot more in the paper. It's, it's a bit difficult to summarize in just a few minutes. Um, but you can see some of the different parameters that we vary. Uh, we also tried every different combination of um, agent behavior and even changing uh, kind of turning knobs within that behavior. Um, and we produced some figures that look like this, <laughs> that are pretty massive figures, uh, where on the Y, the, the large Y axis here, you can see we have like the global ease of recourse, uh, that idea that I talked about earlier. And then we also vary maybe like the number of new agents that are entered. And so in this case, we're looking at 50 time steps and we're looking at this red <clears throat> bar, which is the reliability of recourse over time. So you can see in this scenario, you're interested in we actually had an increase in reliability of recourse over time. And then versus here, you kind of have some decrease. Um, again, the details of each experiment are found in the paper, but here I'll just kind of provide a summary of these. Um, and so we find, I think kind of as expected, that recourse reliability will decrease when the global difficulty of achieving recourse increases. Um, and the number of new agents entering the scenario is greater than the number of positive outcomes. So you have more individuals than that resource constraint. Um, and similarly, we find that with agent behavior settings that are more competitive, so this binary adaptation and flexible effort, they also decrease, decrease recourse reliability. And so the takeaway, again, pretty intuitive, I think, is that a more competitive environment is, the more likely recourse reliability is to decrease. Um, but I think there's actually a more existential observation uh, that we kind of put forward in our paper, but I think needs to also be studied uh, at more depth. But it's this idea that we try all of these various uh, experiments, and if you kind of buy at least some of the assumptions of our, of our framework, we find that there's really only a small set of very specific parameterizations that result in recourse reliability over time. Um, so if you were looking at like a, each one of these is a different simulation, and you can see you almost always have a decreasing, increasing behavior, and it's very rare that you kind of have steady behavior over time. Um, and so this should be kind of concerning for those of us that are actually implementing recourse um, in the real world. Um, and I'll just quickly wrap up here by talking about how we frame our discussion as like a recommendation for practitioners. Um, again, we echo this idea that time-related effects should always be considered when you're uh, implementing recourse. Uh, it seems to be, uh, since this time delta is intrinsic, it seems to always be a consideration that will impact your recourse in some way. We also propose this idea of uh, perhaps not giving a like, definite recourse, but maybe some probability. So you could use recourse reliability to say something like, if you increase your income by $1,000 by in the next six months, you have a 90% chance of getting a loan. And then if you increase your income by $2,000, that increases to 95%. Um, and this is also, um, this idea is echoed by, by similar work um, that I mentioned, mentioned previously. Um, and then the other utility here is that this can be used for system level decision makers, um, which can use agent-based models to try and anticipate changes in recourse that might exist in their system. So in theory, you can measure all of these different, you can measure the model agent behavior and the rates of application um, and implement them into your system. Um, and I'm a little bit of time, so I'll just put, put this in five seconds on the slide. Um, the other thing that we just make in this paper is kind of a call to action to the community. Um, there's actually not a lot of work. In fact, there's 
there's almost none, uh, that actually uses real world data for algorithmic recourse. Um, almost every work is either using synthetic data, like what we did here, or is uh, using data sets that are open and archival that are not intended for recourse. Um, and so I think there's that kind of fundamental need to find real world examples of recourse to better understand what are actually influential challenges and opportunities there. Um, and so for that, I'll um, conclude. I think we can take one question while we switch to our second speaker. Um, it's on your first. Lovely. Thank you so much for a very interesting talk. <laughs> My question is, is somewhat related to your, your last slide about real world data sets, but yeah. slightly different in flavor. Um, so, in your very nice, clear example, um, you assume that the, the company is you know, it's ranking everybody in and having our top 10 or whatever. Right. Um, one can imagine it might be different. Um, so my question is, as researchers, to what extent do we have visibility of what the kind of how these decisions are actually made in practice? Are we guessing or do we know? Um, yeah, what's what's the thing there? Yeah, it's a great question. And exactly why I included that last slide there. Um, mm -hmm. unfortunately the state of play is not very great. As, as far as I can tell, if anybody has seen anything else, please let me know but in you know pretty exhaustive search of literature. Uh, it seems to be the case that there's, there's not a lot of examples of people using recourse in the real world. In, in the real world. Um, even in the lending example, it tends to be like what I presented in the initial slide, where the average action code is something like, you have too much outstanding debt, but there's no clarity about how much debt is actually the, the individual needs to, uh, to, needs to decrease to get the positive outcome. Um, so I think like kind of our approach here was, okay, we really need a framework that's as flexible as possible, where if you could measure these things, you could at least input them, but there isn't any good way right now, as far as we can tell, to measure them. Um, so the one positive thing I could say there, I guess, is that we're, we're starting to try and do a relationship with the, with the bank. 